Okay. Uh, so, excellent. I, I, one thing I've noticed so far is that um, the barbers seem to be open in Egypt, and they're certainly not in the UK, as you can see. Um, so I'm, I'm, I thought I'd give you an update on supracondylar fractures because there's so much to talk about with regards to them. But I, I thought, look, I'll, I'll go through the last 10 years of literature and come up with what's really interesting, what advances have there been, what's new. Um, and I'm going to give you that in light of my experience, which has now become quite considerable, I'm afraid. Um, This is our children's hospital. It's beautiful. And um, this man sometimes visits and I'm, I'm sure some of you know who he is. Um, so he come, sometimes comes in to see the kids, which is nice. Now then, let me move this aside. Okay, so supracondylar fractures. Well, they are the most common fracture treated operatively by children's orthopedic surgeons. They, they weren't always. Um, in the past, they were often treated by traction, but over the last 20 to 30 years, uh, that's been superseded by closed reduction and percutaneous pinning, mostly due to the concerns about um, cubitus varus, uh, which was present in up to 33% of children treated with traction and also um, due to socioeconomic problems with keeping kids in hospital for a very long time. Um, our services have centralised in the UK as they have in the US and a study undertaken there two years ago showed that uh, there's significantly more children being treated in uh, tertiary paediatric centres with supracondylar fractures and as a result of that the incidence of open reduction has decreased and that's certainly our experience in the UK also. Next slide. Hmm. It's an issue. Okay so we don't have time to go through absolutely everything to do with supracondylar fractures. So we're going to drill down into these four really important questions. And there's recent evidence on all of these. Um, and I think I can give you some uh, guidance. So firstly, are there fracture patterns that require specific attention that we should be aware of? Um, what's the best way to wire these fractures? That age old question, but I, I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail. Um, are there any particularly unstable injuries and are, are there any tips I can give you with regards to stabilizing them? And finally, the other age old question, what do we do about the pulseless hand? So are there fracture patterns that require specific attention? Well, there's been quite a lot about, written about this in the last 10 years, so I'm gonna go through it. Um, the first one to mention is this sagittal oblique pattern, and I see this quite a lot um, this paper showed that it was present in about a third of cases, and, and I definitely see this. Um, so you can see here the, um, the diaphyseal components got this sagittal oblique end to it. Um, and I recognize that as being stable, and, and the guys that wrote this paper did as well. And they showed that it has an increased risk for loss of reduction. Now, when I see this, I'm more prone to stabilize it with cross wires or at least three lateral wires. Um, this paper from 2018, uh, excuse, the, excuse the wiring, that's not mine. Um, I don't ever use four wires, but that's from the paper. Um, so they've shown that when medial comminution is present, there's an increased risk for loss of reduction with lateral wires alone. And that stands to reason because they don't get a grip on that on that medial column. Um, two papers have looked at the significance of posterolateral displacement. Um, it's a common fracture pattern and it results in this medial spike. And it's been shown quite clearly to lead to an increased risk for vascular entrapment requiring like exploration. Um, and you can see there the neurovascular bundle, which is a medial structure, is tented over that medial spike. Um, and um, it's being pulled over there 
through its attachments to the forearm distally. And when we see this medial spike, uh, there's also an increased risk for ulnar nerve injury and entrapment of the ulnar nerve um, once attempted reduction has been undertaken. And I've certainly seen this myself. Um, so if I get a fracture that has a big medial spike like that with um, posterolateral displacement and there's medial gapping when I try and reduce it, I've got quite a low threshold now for opening this medially to see whether the ulnar nerves entrapped. Okay, so they're the, um, they're the specific patterns that have been written about in the last 10 years. Um, and I think they're more useful to know about than, than the Gartland's classification, for example. Um, now, what I would ascertain from those papers is, is this. Um, it's very rare for the fracture to not reduce closed. I, I see that probably in about one in a hundred cases, but if it doesn't, there's usually a reason. And in particular, when the fracture gets almost reduced and there's a spongy feeling with a gap present on the X-ray. And that usually means that um, there's something in there and it might just be periosteum, but you might be very unlucky and it's a neurovascular bundle um, or the ulnar nerve. So what I would encourage you to do is that if you think you need to open the fracture, um, either do it anteriorly or go to the side where the medial spike is, because that's probably where the entrapped nerve or vessel is. So then uh, we're going to talk about wiring. Um, now, the old controversy about lateral versus cross wires has got quite boring now, to be honest. There's been so much written about it and um, no one's really shown at any stage that there's any clinical benefit to one over the other um, for all comers, you know, in terms of all fractures that come through the door. Um, in the lab, yeah, crosswise is, is, produces a stiffer construct, but is that actually required clinically? Um, most studies have shown that probably it's not. Um, there's been this meta-analysis carried out by NU uh, three years ago now, um, which has actually shown that there is a difference. So um, in terms of crosswires, um, as we knew anyway, there's a significantly higher iatrogenic ulnar nerve injury. Um, around 5%, um, one in 20 is pretty high really. Um, and they've also shown that cross wires are associated with a statistically significantly higher Flynn score and Flynn score is made up of um, changes in the carrying angle and the range of motion of the elbow. The thing is though, the, the risk ratio, the 95% com the confidence intervals of the risk ratio almost overlap one and and therefore this this really is of doubtful clinical significance and I, I i don't think anyone really has shown that one wiring technique is clinically better than the other what do i do well i use both techniques and i think you do need to have both techniques in your armamentarium and um, i wire the fracture according to the fracture pattern so on the left there, you can see a pair of lateral wires and my default is to use lateral wires. And I use them when we've got a, um, a fracture um, at the level of the um, um, sort of mid level here. Um, I use them when we've got a fracture, fracture with obliquity uh, low on the medial side. And I use them when we've got a distal fracture. Um, and I do that because I'm able to get good spread of my wires and still achieve cortical hold on the medial column. Um, when do I revert to cross wires? Uh, so largely speaking in these two situations. So when we have an oblique fracture that's low on the lateral side, it's not possible to get good cortical hold with lateral wires on the lateral column and maintain good spread at the fracture site. So in order to get that, we need to use cross wires. And the same applies for high fractures. 
So when there's a high fracture, I use cross wires so that I can maintain good spread at the fracture site. If you start trying to use lateral wires here, you've got to be almost parallel and you lose your divergence and your spread as a result. I also keep a low threshold for cross wires in that sagittal oblique pattern that I showed you before. When we've got medial comminution, because if there's an area of comminuted bone here, you can't grip that with the lower of the two wires and therefore you have to start becoming more convergent or even parallel and the spread decreases and therefore the stiffness of the construct. Flexion type fractures, I've got a much lower threshold for cross wires and in what I would call multi-directional instability type fractures but other people would call the grade four. Okay, so as you know, Gartland, uh, Gartland grade is one, undisplaced, two, hinged posteriorly, and three, completely displaced. Grade four, um, or multidirectional instability, is seen when there's complete periosteal disruption and um, instability in all planes, and it's a nightmare to treat. Okay, so lateral wires, how do we do them well? Um, this is a fracture that in my book is amenable to lateral wires, and this is what we did with it. So, I'll run you through the important points um, about doing a good lateral wiring. Firstly, the entry point of the wires has to be perfect, and it has to be perfect on the AP and on the lateral view. So the column wire here, should enter just lateral to the bony capitellum. That means that you can traverse the lateral column and get cortical grip, usually up here on the medial surface of the diaphysis, but it's okay to come out the back too, as we have in this case. As long as you've got cortical hold above the fracture, it's fine. The lowest of the wires should traverse the capitellum. It should then go through the coronoid fossa and there's two additional cortical grip points there and it should exit above the fracture, not through an area of comminution and you should feel the cortex and see uh, that you've gripped that. Uh, now in a grade three I've got a low threshold to put three wires in and that's what we've done in this case. What else is important? Um, the position on the lateral view, and I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but for me, it's very important when you do lateral wiring that those wires are overlapping either the bony capitellum or the metaphyseal component of the humerus distal to the fracture here. Okay, if they're going through the back, not good enough because they're not necessarily gripping the distal fragment. Spacing of the wires at the level of the fracture. It's been studied within the last four years. Um, greater spacing, greater spread leads to a greater construct stiffness. And it, this should be spread at least 13 millimetres or a third of the width of the humerus at the point where the fracture is. Um, these are oblique views, and I use oblique views um, to ensure mainly um, that my wires are going into the distal fragment and into the proximal fragment, and they're very good at showing that. So here we are, don't forget the lateral view. If all the wires are at the back here, you really don't know whether they're gripping this distal fragment and uh, there is a, a higher risk for redisplacement. At the end of your procedure, once you think you've stabilised it, you must, must do a stress view. And if the fracture moves on the stress view, you must act on it. The commonest mistake I see is that people do a stress view, the fracture moves, and then they don't do anything further to stabilise the fracture. Then it redisplaces. What do you do next? If you haven't already, you can add a third lateral wire. 
If you don't feel that that's appropriate or it doesn't work, you can put a medial wire in. How to get cross wires right? Well, it's the, it's the same points. So the entry point's got to be good. You've got to go up the column. You've got to grip bone proximally. Um, and you've got to stress the fracture at the end. This isn't a particularly great one, but it, it's got reasonable spread at the fracture site. It would be lovely if these, if this one was a bit further over here with its entry point and going right up the column and a bit steeper. But it, it's okay. The spread's okay. Now, I don't like the term mini incision to the ulnar nerve. For me, you make an incision that's big enough to see and protect the ulnar nerve. Um, and then you know that you haven't put your wire through it. Now you can still get a post-operative ulnar nerve neuropraxia, but at least you know you haven't put your wire through it. Okay, you might be tenting the ulnar nerve, but at least you know it's okay to leave that wire in for three weeks until the fracture's healed and then pull it out. Okay, so question number three. What about very unstable injuries? Um, and these have been written about by um, Sharma um, two years ago, and um, he's written something I completely agree with, <laughs> which is that the treatment of these fractures is um, very tedious and they're very difficult. And the thing I'll tell you is that you might not realize that you've got a multidirectionally unstable fracture until you get into theater. Um, so you've got to have all these tricks up your sleeve for every single fracture you take. Um, and flexion type injuries are very often multi directionally unstable. So for that reason, I don't use the technique to treat flexion type injuries where the patient's positioned laterally with their elbow over a bolster, because uh, if it turns out to be an MDI injury, it's incredibly difficult uh, to come back from that position. And the real problem, of course, is maintaining a good reduction while also accurately passing your wires. Uh, but I've got some tips to help you with it. So. Firstly, you need a good assistant. You need someone there that can hold the reduction well and someone that's capable of firing wires. Otherwise, you're going to struggle. You've got to tell your theatre team at the start that it's going to be difficult and it's going to take a long time. Go slowly. Use small movements. Millimetres count in this situation. And if things aren't going well, don't keep doing the same thing over and over again. And think about if you're standing up, sitting down. If you're sitting down, standing up, moving. Um, so you've got a different perspective. Um, reduce the fracture with the arm in the position of best fit. If the fracture is unstable in multiple directions, the position of best fit for the reduction is not going to be deep flexion because the fracture will fall off the front. Um, so often, we may be holding the arm in this sort of position and you need someone that can do that for you. The image shows um, the technique called the push-pull manoeuvre and um, putting the um, arm over a rolled up towel um, and um, manipulating it around that. I sometimes use a mallet as well from the medial or lateral side to push on the distal humerus when I'm in this sort of um, dilemma. I would encourage you that when you get your lateral view, not in this situation, not to rotate the patient's shoulder to get that because the fracture is just going to displace. So instead of that, take the C arm and rotate it under the arm board and get the radiographer to do that to get your lateral view. These are really difficult. So once you've got your fracture close to reduction, I advise that you put two provisional lateral wires, get them in as well as you can make your best guess at reduction, and then have a look at what you've got. If the reduction's not great, you can then back them off, just proximal to the fracture, correct the reduction, and then fire them in again. If at that stage you got lucky and they look good, you can keep them and then add a third, either lateral or medial. Um, if they're not great, but the fracture's stabilised, then you can start adding definitive wires. And it's really important at this stage that they're accurate, Sometimes they need to be millimetre perfect. Um, and I encourage trainees um, to place them freehand first to make sure the entry point and the trajectory is accurate before placing them onto the wire driver. 
Uh, so here's one that we did last week. Um, this was a difficult fracture because it's proximal. Um, there's a massive area of, of medial comminution and it was unstable in every single direction. Uh, so just like we said, we have placed two provisional lateral wires there. We couldn't diverge them because we couldn't go through this area of comminution. Um, we then got a provisional reduction and then placed a third medial wire um, and, and that was stable to um, live screening. Uh, but this was a difficult case and it took a long time. Okay, so finally, what about the pulseless hand? Um, so I'm going to give you a cookbook approach to the pulseless hand, which is based on the most recent evidence and um, UK guidance. If your patient preoperatively has no palpable pulse, you need to very, very carefully check skin colour, heat and capillary refill time and compare that to the other hand. If there is any difference at all, then that hand is not perfused. If you're not sure, then that hand is not perfused. And in that case, the patient needs to go to theatre immediately. If the pulse is present, but the hand remains perfused, and we often term this the pink pulseless hand, or uh, for the sake of this presentation, a PPH, uh, then the patient needs to go urgently to theatre. And if they've come in at four o'clock in the morning, it's reasonable to go at eight in the morning if, um, if there is a theatre slot then. Um, but if the hand's not perfused, they go immediately to theatre, regardless of what time at night it is. What do we do in theatre? Well, regardless what situation you were in, the first thing you're going to do is reduce the fracture. If there's a gap in the fracture with a spongy feeling, then you're going to explore. OK, and we would typically be um, letting our plastic or vascular surgeon know in advance of going to theatre with any of these. Um, uh, and it needs to be someone who's skilled in microvascular repair. Now, if, if there's orthopaedic surgeons that are, that, that's fine. But in the UK, that doesn't tend to be the case. If at this stage we've got a well-reduced fracture, uh, we wire it. And then we very, very carefully assess the perfusion of the hand again. And at this point, I would actually go as far as washing off with saline uh, the skin prep so that we can see um, a comparative colour to the other side. If the hand is definitely perfused at that time, that's OK. You can put your plaster on, make sure that you don't flex it beyond 80 to 90 degrees, and then observe the patient as an inpatient for the next 48 hours. Um, it's OK if their pulse doesn't come back, but if they lose hand perfusion or develop a compartment syndrome, then they're straight back to theatre. Having reduced the fracture, if the hand is now no longer perfused, or if you're uncertain, then you or you together with your microvascular surgeon are going to explore. And um, that will be done through an anterior approach that can be extended um, in a lazy S fashion. And on the proximal side, that would be medial because that's where the bundle is. In about a third of cases, they'll just be um, entrapment of the bundle or it's been um, tented by um, fibrous tissue attached to it uh, but in at least a half even up to two-thirds of cases there's going to be a true vessel injury that needs a microvascular uh, repair or graft. So what's the justification for this position? Well two papers published last year. Uh, the first one in a vascular journal uh, a systematic review of 203 pink pulseless hands uh, with no evidence that observation of the perfused hand following fixation led to any of these complications. Um, there has been debate in the past, uh, quite significant debate from small retrospective studies uh, in pink pulseless hands associated with an anterior interosseous nerve palsy as to whether that subgroup of patients require um, routine exploration. Uh, so this is yeah, written by Harris from the US uh, two years ago. This is the biggest series of uh, that particular problem and um, 52 patients uh, with a 
pink pulse of the hand and either an anterior enterosseous or a median nerve palsy were treated with closed reduction and percutaneous pinning and observation and only two of them required a further intervention. Um, they are the main messages I wish to get across to you um, so I hope that's useful and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much Mr. Walton for this very interesting talk. Uh, Mr. Rami is uh, the moderator of uh, the marvelous talk of uh, Mr. Walton. Mr. Rami. Uh, thank you very much Mr. Walton for your brilliant talk and it covered uh, a lot of debates around subrocondylar fracture. I have received a few questions about, about it. So uh, how many trials of closed reduction before you decide for opening subrocondylar fracture? Do you, and which case would you say before taking the patient to say that this patient will need opening for sure? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll address the second question first because it's the easiest. Um, there is never a situation when the patient will definitely need to be opened. Um, I will always try very, very hard to reduce these fractures closed. And the only circumstance I've ever opened them has been either when there's um, a vascular injury that doesn't resolve and the hand remains non-perfused following closed reduction, or when it's very clear that there's a structure interposed um, on the intraoperative imaging. Um, how many times would I try closed? Always one more. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, about Gartland classification, for type one, it is for sure conserved treatment. Why type two is still controversial up till now? And what is your trick when you see Gartland type two? Yeah, I mean, this is actually quite topical. So during the pandemic, um, we have been treating some of these conservatively more often, okay? Because we've got less access to theater and there's, there were initially some concerns about taking kids to theatre because of COVID. I mean, those concerns have pretty much gone now. Um, and there is recent evidence uh, within the last year, actually, that sagittal um, angulation and translation of um, Gartland II supracondylar fractures, particularly in kids under the age of five, can remodel even a 100% even translation of the capitellum posteriorly. Um, so, yeah, th there's massive debate over this. I don't think we have an answer to it. Um, personally, I think we probably do overtreat them. And um, the results of the patients that we've treated conservatively through the pandemic may shed some light on that. Um, what do I do? Um, if there's a rotational component to it, so i.e. a Gartland 2B, then that's going to theatre and it's getting wires. Um, if it's a younger patient with a 2A, so no rotational component, then I do have a low threshold to flex the elbow, put a plaster on and take a repeat x-ray. And if I think the position is acceptable, um, then I will sometimes run with that. It, it depends on how much I trust the patient as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. For Gartland type 3, in theater, when you reduce the fracture and it is in a very good position, do you see some cases you say no need for wire, just a plaster, and it will be fine? Not in Gartland 3, not for me. Um, never. Um, one, one, thing I, one thing I forgot to say, um, and I, I learned this when I was in New Zealand, actually, um, and I, I don't know how this um, equates to your practice in Egypt, but in, in New Zealand, there's a higher risk for musculoskeletal infection and there's a higher risk for um, infect, infected metal wear. Um, they don't know why, but they were very unkeen to use lateral wiring because the lower of the two lateral wires, well, both lateral wires are actually intra-articular. So if there's a, an infected pin site, it's more likely um, to lead to intra-articular infection uh, than cross wires. Um, now we, we don't have that issue in the UK, um, but I, I wondered whether that might be an issue for you guys in Egypt. Yes, it, it is not common to have pin track site infection, but it, 
it happens a lot. So uh, about nerve injury with supracondylar fractures, uh, before trial of reduction, when you see when you see a supracondylar with nerve injury, when do you say I need to explore this nerve, or you will leave it just for a wait and see? Yeah. Um, so the only situation that I would explore a nerve in would be there would be two situations. Sorry. Firstly, um, posterolateral displacement with a medial spike with a fracture that's not reducing and an ulnar nerve injury. That needs exploration. Secondly, um, in patients who have a preoperative pulseless hand, who go to theatre and either a reduction is not possible um, or when the reduction occurs, the hand is not perfused anymore. Uh, now, you, you'll usually see that in combination with an anterior interosseous or a median nerve injury. So in that situation, you know, you, you're exploring the vessel, you're exploring the nerve as well at the same time. It's right next to it. Um, so those are the situations. Now, I don't ever um, routinely explore a nerve in any other situation. And there's evidence to back that up from Boston Children's Hospital, published ooh, 2017. So that's Ben Shaw, um, very pr prolific author. Um, so they've shown that of all comers for nerve injuries with supracondylar fractures in a really big series, there's a 92% that without exploration, that nerve will return to normal within six months and a 60% chance that it will return to normal within three months. Okay, amazing. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, about more reduction, uh, about malunion after supracondylar fracture, I know it is not the topic right now, but... Uh, someone asked about, uh, Mr. Al Said asked about which osteotomy do you use if the child develops uh, cubitus varus? Yeah, the French one. So, yeah. Uncommon to do it, though. I have to say, pretty uncommon to do it. Uh, there are many questions about uh, pulseless uh, uh, hand and, and pink one, but you have covered it really good uh, and uh, systematically well uh, uh, in your presentation and i don't uh, i don't have any more question about it thank you no problem thanks very much thank you so much mr walton for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation thank you so much sir